I hope everyone had a delicious meal. Very good. I'd, I'd like to thank the uh, excellent staff of our Fresh Ideas catering team for having a, a banquet in the gym. You've done a fabulous job, thank you. Uh, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing a gentleman that has really been the glue that has made this weekend work. Um, Mr. Philip Beckman is the senior fellow of the Association of Fellows of Churchill College, Churchill Museum, Westminster College. Philip is a distinguished alumnus, an attorney, a friend. His full bio is written in your program, so I won't read here what's written there. But suffice to say that Churchill himself, I think, would be proud of the senior fellow here, Philip Beckman. Philip? Thank you, Tim, and uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us here tonight. I've got the great honor of um, telling you that thanks to your incredibly generous support, the 50th anniversary celebrations mark uh, the single largest fundraiser for the Aldermanbury Church and the museum in their history since the relocation in, in the 1960s. We've managed to raise over $800,000 for the critical preservation of the church. Well, I'm also honored to uh, be able to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, David Rubenstein. So when Churchill spoke here in uh, 1946, he spoke for actually about 50 minutes. And I think to do justice to David's accomplishments and career, it would probably take about that long. And since, while I do wear a medal, uh, my speaking skills are in no way, or no way remotely Churchillian, I'll uh, try to keep this uh, brief so we can get David up on the stage. As you will have seen, though, from reading in the program his background and uh, what he's done over his career, he is the essence of a true Churchillian, with a ferocious appetite for learning, engaging, sharing, leading, and I would even say a little bit of reinvention. But I think what really makes David so perfectly suited for this important occasion here is his passion for history and for his country. While Churchill, like any man, was not perfect, he was undoubtedly a patriot and also a great believer in history and its importance and as a guidepost. What David's done to preserve American history and to make it available to the citizens of the country is really incredible and quite laudable. I'd also encourage you to please try to watch his uh, television show, Peer to Peer. Not only does he give, I think, you know, really in compelling interviews with really the most interesting leaders of our time, you'll also see on the show that he has, I think, the most brilliant poker face of all time. No matter who his guest is, or what his guest may say or not say, David doesn't flinch. However, I think it's not just a great poker face, but really what comes through is a genuine respect and interest in his guests. And for we Midwesterners here tonight, I think that sort of respect and interest is something we can particularly appreciate and understand. So David, while it might seem odd for a kid from Baltimore who uh, spent a lot of his life in Washington, I'd like to say, just as Truman did to Churchill, welcome home. Thank you for that kind and overly uh, 
generous introduction. How many people here are descendants of Winston Churchill? Okay. Can you stand up, the descendants? Okay, well, thank you very much for coming, and thank you for the legacy. How many people here heard Churchill's speech in 1946? One, two, three, three people. Well, thank you. Four, five. And how many people here flew 43 combat missions in World War II? All right. Thank you for your service. How many of you are graduates of Westminster? Okay. How many of you, all right, how many of you want to be graduates of Westminster? Okay. How many of you are donors to Westminster? Okay. How many of you will be donors to Westminster? Okay. I'm, on my TV show, I don't know if anybody's watched it, but uh, it's a show that what happened was, uh, to be honest, I became the president of the Economic Club of Washington a few years ago. And I was supposed to just bring business people in to speak. And I was told, just get a business person to speak, then questions come up from the audience, read the questions, and then that's it, four times a year. Well, I started doing this, and I realized that business people are really not that gifted in the speaking world, and people were falling asleep. So I, and the questions that came up from the members were even worse than the speeches. So I would get the cards and I would pretend I was reading a question from a member, but I was making it up. And I was trying to do it with some humor and people liked it. So Bloomberg saw it and they said, why don't you do this on TV? I said, okay. And they said, we'll call it the David Rubenstein Show. And I said, geez, I don't know if a long Jewish name is really gonna work. And they said, well, at Bloomberg, we don't think it's a problem. So. <laughs> So before the show actually started, though, I, um, I had some uh, interviews with uh, people at the Economic Club of Washington. Right before uh, we were looking for a speaker one time, somebody said, why don't we, this was in 2014, I think it was, why don't we get Donald Trump? I said, well, Donald Trump, I, I know him, but I don't really think, you know, he'd be a great speaker. They said, how do you know him? I said, well, here's how I know him. Uh, my parents uh, grew up in, my parents were blue collar workers. They were not college educated. Um, they retired to a suburb of Baltimore called West Palm Beach, Florida. And, and they thought that Palm Beach was for wealthy people and they really would never go to Palm Beach because they didn't think they were appropriate. They just were blue collar people. They didn't think they'd go to Palm Beach. But when I would want to have a wedding event or a celebration or something, for my, my parents, I would bring them, I'd say, we'd go to Mar-a-Lago. You didn't need to be a member, to be honest. You just have a credit card you can get in. So we would have a lot of these events there with my family, and uh, every time a you know, tall man with kind of orange hair would show up and want to get in the middle of the photos. <laughs> and uh, so as I go back over the years, I see most of my family events have a tall man in the middle of it photobombing my, uh, my family events. So eventually, after about six years of this, I, I said, you know, I'm in the business world too. And he said, yes, I've heard of you and um, you've got good firm and so forth. And that was about it. That's the extent of my relationship. But I, I sent him a letter, Donald Trump, and I said, would you come to the Economic Club of Washington and let me interview you? And within five minutes, I got a uh, faxed letter back saying, I'll be there. Just give me the date. So we arranged the date. He came to the green room and he said, David, ask me anything you want. No problems, but ask me two questions for sure. What are they? First one is, ask me if I'm running for president. And I said, president of what? He said, <laughs> president of the United States. I, I said, Donald, you have no chance of being president of the United States. I've lived in Washington 40 years. You're never going to be president of the United States. He says, I know, but I'll help my brand for a couple months. I'll do it. OK, what's the second question? Ask me if my hair is real, and you pull the hair and show people it's real, because people think it's fake. I said, geez, I don't really feel comfortable pulling your hair, but I'll ask you about it. 
Well, we had a good interview, and the only question I stumped them on was this. I said, Donald, you know, I sometimes feel like I don't know if I should do this or that. Um, I have self-doubt. Do you ever have any self-doubt about anything? He says, what is self-doubt? What do you mean? So, he didn't know. So, um, so, anyway, the interview was covered live on C-SPAN. C-SPAN 2, I think it was. The next day, Donald called me up and said, David, it was the best interview I've ever had, and I want to thank you for doing it, and I'm going to make you an honorary member of Mar-a-Lago. And by the way, you should know that it was the highest rated show in the 40-year history of C-SPAN. <laughs> so I called Brian Lamb, the founder, and I said, what were the ratings? They said, there are no ratings, nobody could know. So, <laughs> anyway. When I received the invitation to speak here, I thought this must be a mistake and very daunting to speak at the same lectern as Winston Churchill in the same gym as Winston Churchill. You know, I really, it wasn't appropriate for me. So I had three questions that came to my mind. One, was it somebody else they had intended to invite? <laughs> because sometimes I've been confused with another person who has the same initials as DR and it's David Rockefeller Jr. And because there's a connection that some of you may not have known about, when my ancestors were coming over from England, as it turned out, um, they came to Ellis Island and their name was Rockefeller, but they said, we want a nice ethnic Jewish name so people know we're Jewish, so they got rid of Rockefeller and they made it Rubenstein. So sometimes I, you know, people get confused, DR, DR, so um, I thought maybe the invitation was for, for David Rockefeller Jr. to come. So I thought it was a mistake. And sometimes any of you get emails or invitations that are a mistake or you get the mail from somebody else. Well, I thought it was somebody else's you know, invitation. So I, the first question was, you know, is it a mistake? Uh, later I checked and they said it wasn't a mistake. Then I said the second question in my mind is, is it appropriate for me to give a speech at the same lectern as Winston Churchill? Well. <laughs> That's not what my children said. Um, <laughs> they said, and my friend said, you know, we know you, you're a friend of ours, but you're no Winston Churchill. <laughs> and then I said to myself a third question, what could I possibly say that would live up to the standards of Winston Churchill? What could I possibly say that would remind people of Winston Churchill in some way? And I thought, do I have any connections to Winston Churchill? And I thought about three of them. One, I have an American mother. <laughs> Two, I have a receding hairline. And three, I have an expanding waistline. Those were the only things that I thought I had in common with Winston Churchill. So I said, I'm not sure I should accept this invitation. Um, but Philip, among others, uh, talked to me and he said, um, it's okay, we know you're not Winston Churchill and we have very, very low expectations, so uh, please accept. And so I, I'm honored to be here and I wanted to uh, uh, let you know that. But as I was thinking about this, um, I got a letter uh, that came to me on my iPad. Some of you may have gotten these kind of things as well. It came from Winston Churchill. Dear Mr. Rubenstein, I understand that you'll be delivering the speech at the 50th anniversary of the opening of the Churchill Museum at Westminster College this year. I guess it was not possible to get a former prime minister to do that, but couldn't they have easily tried to get a cabinet officer, a small state governor, or a mayor, or even a city council member? You're the best that they could do. Now, I'm told that private equity is now a big thing in the US, but I must say, I was a more than a bit surprised that America has fallen to a level where a, mayor, a mere finance man, and not even a finance minister, is asked to fill the shoes of someone who almost single-handedly saved the Western world. But so be it. I'm writing to simply ask you to convey my appreciation to Westminster College for having invited me to speak nearly 75 years ago. That opportunity gave me the chance in a setting the whole world was watching to give my view on the emerging dangers of the Soviet Union, and it worked. My views on the Soviet Union turned out to be right. And as a result, the British people brought me back into the prime minister position. I won the Nobel Prize for Literature, 
my paintings improved and actually became marketable. <laughs> I became an honorary American citizen, and I lived to the age of 90. I am convinced, therefore, that speaking at Westminster College is looked upon quite favorably by God. <laughs> For good things happen afterwards, most especially a long life. This, of course, assumes you give a good, thoughtful, and meaningful speech, like mine. So no pressure, but your future career and the length of your time on this earth depends on how you do in your speech. I will be watching intently. Please give my regards to my friends at Westminster and let them know that my day in Fulton was one of the most enjoyable days in my long life. Best regards, Winston Churchill. So, so um, I'll do the best I can. I don't know whether I'll have a long life as a result of this, but I'll try to uh, do the best I can at capturing a few ideas. And I call my speech uh, sinews, sinews of History. And I talk about American history a little bit. Uh, but I want to make sure everybody knows I am not a scholar of Winston Churchill. The greatest scholar of Winston Churchill is Andrew Roberts. He's sitting right there. <laughs> He has written the best one-volume vo book on Winston Churchill, also the longest one-volume <laughs> book on Winston Churchill. It's an extraordinary book. I'm going to interview Andrew um, or a TV show in New York later this week, and I hope all of you will watch the interview uh, not too long from now. It will be on public broadcasting. I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, I would just give you my own perspectives on why the speech here got so much attention and why we still remember it nearly 75 years later. First of all, the speech actually was extremely well crafted. And had Shakespeare himself been asked to rewrite it, I doubt that he could have made many improvements. It was a masterfully written word for word. Winston Churchill worked on it. And like all of his speeches, carefully done, masterfully written. But secondly, it was masterfully given. Many people write great speeches, but they can't deliver them. And some people have terrible speeches, and they give a good delivery. But this speech was well-written, well-crafted, and it was delivered in a way that the best Shakespearean actor, Lord Olivier, perhaps, could not have done a better job. And so, to some extent, uh, we remember it because the, the, the way it was written was beautiful, the way it was delivered was wonderful. And I no doubt that the American politicians who were sitting there were saying, uh-oh, this is an incredible standard. Uh, we could never live up to this standard. And American people are sitting there saying, how come we don't have any politicians that can speak like that and write speeches like that? So it was the delivery, it was the wording, but also it was the message. At that time, for those who may not remember, Winston Churchill was not then the prime minister. Amazingly, he had been cast out, his party lost, and so after being prime minister throughout the war and helping to win the war, for Great Britain, he was um, the leader of the opposition party. And so when he came here, he was not the prime minister, but he had an important message he wanted to give, and the message was essentially that the Soviet Union was not living up to the promises that had been given at Potsdam and at Yalta. And the Soviet Union was encroaching further west, and actually we're going to take over all of uh, Eastern Europe, if not more than that, and the Iron Curtain that Churchill talked about was descending. Now at the time, uh, that was actually a novel message because people thought, wait a second, the Soviet Union lost more people in World War II than any other country. Uncle Joe Stalin seemed like a nice man. He was our ally. How could we be so critical of him? And in fact, the New York Times the next day and other people said Churchill was an alarmist. Now, as time passed, we know that Char Churchill was not alarmist. He was telling us exactly what was going to happen. And had we listened to him, and had people taken his warnings to heed right away, maybe we could have shortened the Cold War, maybe we could have been more successful in the Cold War in some respects, and maybe uh, the world would be different. But we didn't. People uh, criticized him a bit, but now the speech is seen as so prescient that it captures everybody's memory. But suppose I had been here giving that same speech in 1946, or any of you had given the same speech, would it still have the same resonance, the same message, the same delivery, would it have the same resonance? No because it was given by Winston Churchill. And why is it so different when Winston Churchill gives that speech than if any of you gave it or I gave it? Well, the answer is this. He was a man who captures the American attention, and still does, the way no other foreigner has ever 
uh, captured Americans' attention. For example, he was the first Amer person, not American citizen, to be given honorary American citizenship. The first one. There have only been eight people who have been given honorary American citizenship. He was the first one. And why did we give it to him? Why did the Congress give him that? Because of the life story is so compelling. He had many trials and tribulations through a long life. And in fact, at the age of 64, had he died at 64, we wouldn't have remembered him probably because he had so many failures in his life, early in his life in military conquests or military losses or in World War I. But it wasn't until, six, 19, six, until he was 65 years old that he actually became prime minister. Think about it, many people here, many people I know, at 65, they're ready to go play a little shuffleboard or maybe slow down a bit. Of course, today, increasingly, I think 65 is a teenager, but for many people, 65 in those days was uh, relatively old to be assuming a new position, but he became prime minister at 65, so we admire him because he came back from many defeats, many difficult times in his life, and, and his message to Europe and to England and to the United States was, Nazis have to be stopped. And finally, he got a chance at 65 to become prime minister and to actually do something to stop the Nazis. The story is also so compelling about Winston Churchill because Winston Churchill won the war. With the help of Americans and other people, he won the war. And so the image is he came back from defeat and oblivion in many ways. And as prime minister, he rallied the British people, he rallied the American people, and he really made it possible for us to beat the Nazis. Just think about this. Suppose Winston Churchill had not been the prime minister. Suppose Neville Chamberlain had remained as prime minister. How many people here think that history would have gone out gone the same way? It wouldn't have. Churchill almost single-handedly rallied the Western world. And so we admire him for that. We also admire him because of his language and his literary skills. Remember, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature, but also for oratory as well as part of the prize, because he had a way of speaking, a way of communicating, that honestly we see very few public figures able to replicate that. And then, amazingly, after he was cast out as prime minister, after World War II was won, he stayed as the leader of the opposition, he came back as prime minister later, in his 70s. And what he did then was also quite remarkable. So the reason we admire this speech and we admire Churchill for having given it was his message was prescient and he was a, such a unique person that Americans really honored him with our citizenship. So what would he say if he were here today? If he were here today, would he say there is another problem? What would he warn us about? What I suspect, and nobody really knows what he would say, so it's easy to say this is what he might say. But he probably would say that actually the Cold War isn't really over. And while we think we won it in 1989, it's kind of resurfacing a bit, so don't ignore what's going on in this, from the Soviet Union. Secondly, he might say that terrorism that we now see spreading out from the Middle East and other parts of the world is now as dangerous a problem as the Cold War and the Soviet Union was. He might also say that what we're seeing from Asia um, is an effort from people in China and other parts of the world, but particularly in China, to really take over uh, much of the Western world or in terms of technology, in terms of uh, influence and so forth. And so there is a bit of a bamboo curtain that's descending on part of the world. And so many people in the world are now being asked to pick between the United States technology, the United States way of life, and let's say a Chinese way of life or Chinese technology. Not quite the same as the Cold War, but Churchill might warn us about that. And of course, he might warn us that maybe Brexit is not in the best interest of Britain. Now, some people, Andrew might think it is in the best interest, or Andrew has said, the truth is we don't really know what Churchill uh, would think, but it's fun to say whatever you think, Churchill would think, and that's very popular to do. So, I don't know what Churchill would think, but I suspect he would warn us that whatever happens with Brexit would be a challenge uh, for England and for Europe and the United States. But I don't really know what Churchill would say and what he would warn us about, but let me tell you what I would like to have you be warned about and think about, and it's this. The greatest challenge to the United States today is not an external threat. The things that I just mentioned, Brexit, terrorism, China, um, things like that well, might be significant and or per perhaps a reemergence of the Cold War. I don't think that's our greatest challenge. We can overcome that. We can surely have the resources to conquer those problems. I think the biggest problem we have 
are internal challenges, not external challenges. Think about this. Right now, the United States, the wealthiest country in the world, has $22 billion of debt. We're adding about $1.3 trillion of debt every year in our budget. So at some point, when you have this much debt, you have to pay the price. So one of the internal challenges I'm worried about is the amount of debt we have already and the amount of debt we're adding every year. A second challenge is the entitlements program we have. When Social Security was set up, there were 34 workers for every retiree. Now we have about two and a half workers for every retiree. And the truth is the Social Security system, the Medicare system, the Medicaid system are basically going to go bankrupt unless we do something about it. And we have to do it sometime soon. A third challenge is the state entitlement programs or state pension plans. There are six the state pension plans are $6 trillion underfunded. So if you are uh, collecting a state pension, uh, you expect to be careful because there are six, those plans together are $6 trillion unfunded or underfunded. Another challenge we have, an uh, internal challenge, is the uh, problem of crime and gun crime. Uh, today, 100 people are killed in the United States by guns every single day, 100 people. With at that rate, our rate of gun killings in the United States is 25 times the rate of any other developed country in the world, 25 times. So that's another internal challenge we have to deal with. Another challenge is obesity. One third of Americans are, by the definition of the U.S. government, obese, one third. And if you're obese, the chance of you're getting um, many disease, heart problems, and other uh, related things like diabetes is very, very high, and the cost of the country is very high. So that's another challenge for our country. Another challenge is income inequality. Today, 1% of the population owns roughly half the wealth. 1% of the population owns half the wealth. And related to that is social mobility. When people at the bottom of the, of the economic totem pole don't think that they can get to the top, they stop working. And the result is you have a, a system where there's no longer a belief in the American dream. In my case, I came from very modest circumstances. I believed in the American dream. I thought it was possible to rise up, and I was able to do so. But many people today at the bottom don't think that anymore. And the, the rising level of income inequality and the lack of social mobility is making us a country of really two divisions. Those people that are the haves and the have-nots, and the have-nots don't think that they can get to the top any longer. Another problem we have in the country is illiteracy. Think about this. It's hard to believe that there are 14% of American adults cannot read past the fourth grade level. If you can't read past the fourth grade level, your chance of making any economic uh, income of any consequence is modest, very modest. And so today we have about 34 million people, adults, who are Ill, functionally illiterate. They can't read past the fourth grade level. Another internal challenge we have is the high school dropout rate. We are uh, about a million and a half, uh, million and a half high school students are dropping out of high school every single year. Every single year, million and a half. Those people have the same problems. If you're a high school dropout, your chances of being in the criminal justice system is terrific. And in fact, it turns out that 60% of all federal prisoners are either high school dropouts or functionally illiterate. So if you can't read, you're a high school dropout, your chance of being in the criminal justice system is extraordinary. Another problem we have is, unfortunately, opioids. We are today um, in a situation where roughly 75,000 people a year are dying of opioids, opioid overdose, 75,000 people. No doubt some of you have been affected by this in friends or family, and that problem is getting worse. We also have a problem of a million and a half people in this country are homeless. A million and a half people are homeless. And any of you go to big cities, I don't know how it is here, but if you walk in a big city, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., you often have to step over people who are living there on the streets. And this problem is growing, it's not receding. And I'll mention one last, which is, the problem is the federal government is a bit at a stalemate. It's dysfunctional. When the system was set up, it was supposed to be checks and balances, but it was supposed to be not a system where nothing happened. And right now, the major issues of the country, let's say immigration or infrastructure, are not being addressed at all by Congress. So you take a look at all these issues and you say, oh, the biggest challenge we have is not Brexit, and it's not terrorism, and it's not China. It's our own inability to solve our problems and work together. Now, I 
didn't mean to depress you, and I wanted to let you know that the truth is the United States has been the biggest economic power in the world since 1870, and we've been the biggest political power in the world and the biggest military power in the world since World War II, and for at least another 25 years or so, we'll probably be the biggest economic power. And we'll, for most of the lifetime of everybody in this room, we'll be the most dominant political power and military power in the world. We have enormous natural resources. We have incredible uh, university system. The, 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 our university system is the envy of the world, for sure. We have um, an entrepreneurial spirit. We have a, despite the fact that government isn't working right now, it's a stable government. You don't have to worry about government being overthrown, military takeovers, the things you often worry about in other countries. And we also have in this country uh, the opportunity, I think, to uh, worship the way you want to worship. So many of the great things that this, this country is built on is, are here and they're here for a while, but we have to address some of these problems. Now, let me address one other problem that I wanted to mention that I, I haven't mentioned now. The, all the ones I've mentioned, all of you have heard about before, and I didn't tell you anything you probably didn't know. But let me tell you something that you may not have thought about. When this country was started, the principle on which it was based was articulated very well by Thomas Jefferson. In the Declaration of Independence, he said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, unfortunately, he never defined happiness the rest of his life, and he lived another 50 years. And of course, how could he have written that? He had two slaves with him, and he owned 200 slaves, so how could he say all men are, are are equal. Obviously what he meant was all white Christian men are equal. But as we have interpreted this over the years and as Lincoln ultimately worked upon it when he said in, in uh, the Gettysburg Address four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. He was echoing Jefferson and what he felt was that all men, black and white, men and women are equal. Now obviously, over many, many years, after the Civil War, the Jim Crow laws, the laws against women being able to vote, many things had to change before we got close to the creed that Jefferson was writing about. What Jefferson wrote about was really the creed of this country. It was the creed that it was based on. And we hoped eventually that we would get to the point where all people are, are given equal opportunity, all people can do what they want, and, and entitled to pursue happiness. We haven't reached that, but we're making progress but I think increasingly the soul of our country is being lost in part, not only for this reason, but in part because people know so little about our country's history and so little about our government that they can't be effective citizens anymore. Less than 50% of the people eligible to vote in this country vote in presidential elections. In state and lower uh, uh, office elections, less than 25% of the people eligible to vote vote. And I think when you have a democracy, if people don't participate in it, they live, leave, lose their hope in the democracy and they don't become effective citizens. The reason this country has worked so well over the years and can be uh, such an effective country and the, uh, and the country that everybody admires around the world is because it's a functioning democracy where people are part of the system. But as the voting percentages go down, it's getting to be harder and harder to believe that we can challenge, all, we can accomplish all we want and solve our internal problems by having citizens who don't participate in the system. And not only do they not participate, they know so little about the government, they know so little about our history. This is hard to believe, but in 49 of the 50 states, in a recent test that was done, 49, the citizens in 49 states who are native-born Americans could not pass the citizenship test that foreigners have to pass in order to become citizens. A foreigner takes a, uh, takes a test, and 91% of the foreigners pass the test when they take it. But in 49 of the 50 states, when it recently the, the test was done, for native-born Americans, 49 states, 60%, uh, you needed 60% to pass the test, 60% uh, approval rate, 60% uh, correct answers. 49 of the 50 states had people who could not pass that test. But other things are indicative of this as well. A recent survey by Annenberg showed that three quarters of Americans, 75%, cannot name the three branches of government. Uh, the same survey showed that one third of Americans cannot name a single branch of government. Another survey showed that 20% of Americans cannot tell you within 20 years, either way, which, war, which years the Civil War occurred. 
10% of Americans think that Eisenhower was a general in the Civil War. 30% of Americans think that George Washington crossed the Rhine River during the Revolutionary War. 30% of Americans think that Larry Summers was the first Treasury Secretary. 25% of Americans don't know that the right to free speech is guaranteed in the Constitution. And 10% of college graduates think that Judge Judy is a member of the United States Supreme Court, <laughs> which is not yet the case. Um, so we don't, why has this happened? Well, because of our interest in STEM, and STEM is important, we don't teach civics anymore in high school very much, or junior high school. We don't teach American history very much in high school or in college. In fact, you can graduate from any college in the United States today without having to take an American history course. You can graduate from 80% of the colleges in the United States as a history major and not take an American history course. So these are concerns to mine, and I try to do something about it. Let me talk about it uh, briefly. And it came about by serendipity. And let me tell you what I mean. I was minding my own business one day, and I got an invitation, and it said, come and view the Magna Carta. It's in New York. I said, well, the Magna Carta must be in London. What's it doing in New York? I didn't know, and a friend of mine invited me, and I went there, and the person at the place called Sotheby's said, um, it's actually being auctioned off. I said, how can you sell the Magna Carta? He said, well, there are 17 copies of the Magna Carta, 15 in British institutions, one in the Australian Parliament, and one was bought by Ross Perot in 1981, from a family in Britain who were, had gone land poor. They had it in their family for four, 500 years, and they needed to sell it or they would lose their estate. So Ross Perot sent a lawyer over. His uh, name is Tom Luce. He went over and negotiated the sale. He rolled it up in a tube, and he took it back through British Customs, and British Customs said when he was leaving, what's in that tube? And he said, well, the Magna Carta. Of course, they thought it was a joke, but he actually, what? It, it was the Magna Carta. He brought it back to the United States, and it was on display for a while, but then, ultimately, he put it up for sale, and I was told by the curator at uh, Sotheby's that it would go to somebody from Russia or Saudi Arabia or South Africa, and I thought, clearly, the Magna Carta, which was the inspiration for the Declaration of Independence, and, and most of the colonial charters said that the col colonies had the rights of the Magna Carta, the rights of, uh, that were given to British citizens. So it was clearly important in our country's history. Some people would say more important in our history in many ways than it was in English history. So I thought one copy should remain here. So I decided to go back the next night and buy it. Now, I didn't want to tell anybody I was going to go buy the Magna Carta. It sounds presumptuous to say I'm going to go buy the Magna Carta tomorrow. <laughs> and I didn't want to tell my children. They might say, how much less money might this mean for us? I didn't want to tell them. So I went back and I went in the little room and they, and at Sotheby's and they put me in a room and you're auctioning off and they, I got carried away and all of a sudden, boom, they said, sold. So I didn't, couldn't hear what they were saying. They came into this room and they said, you just bought the Magna Carta. Uh, who, who are you? And um, said, well, I, I gave my name. They said, can you afford this? I said, well, I can. They said, as long as you can afford it, you can slip out the side door and nobody will know who bought it or you can tell the 100 reporters there. And I said, no, I don't mind telling them. So I went there and I said, look, I came from very modest circumstances. My parents didn't graduate from college. My father never made more than seven or $8,000 a year. I got where I am by scholarships and so forth. So I owe this country a great deal. And I want to give this as a gift to the country. So I'm going to put it in the National Archives where it will be forever, and that's where it is today. And I realized that when you, when you have something like the Magna Carta, what's happened since it's been there is Americans go and look at it, and they learn more about history because when they see it, they want to go and read more about it. Now, you can watch the Magna Carta on the computer slide, but if you see the real document, you go back and you read more about history, maybe you learn more about it. So I realized that having historic documents in places where people could see them readily available would be a good way to educate people about history a little bit. So I started buying historic documents, the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, the Emancipation Proclamation, the 13th Amendment, which, which freed the slaves, and put them in places around the United States so people can see them and maybe learn a little bit more about American history. And then another thing happened by serendipity. I was in Washington one day, and uh, I was, I'm the chairman of the Kennedy Center, the Kennedy Center of Performing Arts, and on our board was the, sec was the Secretary of Interior's designated person, uh, the, the head of the National Park Service. And he told me that there had been an earthquake in Washington. I'd been out of town. I didn't know how serious it was. And he told me the Washington Monument had earthquake damage and have to close it for a year or two to fix it. And I said, well, how, what's the problem? He said, well, getting the money out of Congress is going to take forever. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll put up the money, forget the Congress. 
Um, and so he said, okay, and I tell me, just tell me how much it costs, I'll put up the money. He later called me back and said, well, it costs a certain amount of money, but now Congress says that they don't want anybody to get credit for doing something good, so could they put up some of the money? I said, okay, fine. So they did. So we fixed the Washington Monument, and then I realized that people regard it as an important national treasure, and I began to say, maybe I can fix up other things that people will go see if they're in better shape. So I began to fix up Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's home, Montpelier, James Madison's home, Arlington House at the top of Arlington Cemetery, the Iwo Jima Memorial, Mount Vernon, uh, and other kinds of historic buildings, build, buildings. And people would go to these people, places more and maybe learn more about the history. And my thinking was that maybe I could even educate members of Congress about history. So I started a program to educate members of Congress, yes, about six years ago, I started taking the best historians in the United States, and I interviewed them once a month in front of only members of Congress. And it's amazing that members of Congress actually are very interested in American history, and they learn more about it, and they tell me this is the best thing they're doing in Congress, which is a sad commentary sometimes. <laughs> but So what I've been trying to do, and I tell you all this not to pat myself on the back, but to say to all of you that we don't know that much about our country's history. We don't know much about our country's government in many ways. And all of us should think about what we might be able to do to uh, remind people about it. Because I think if we learn more about the country's history, learn more about what made this country great, how we were founded, maybe the soul of our country will be recaptured in some ways. And so I'd like to tell everybody that I talk to, I'd like all of you to think about this. All of you, no doubt, if you're in this room, you're obviously very successful people and very uh, successful citizens, and clearly you're people that have done something philanthropically in life. But think about what you might be able to do to make this country a slightly better place by one different type, one thing or another. You don't have to do what I've done. I'm trying to remind people of American history in some ways, and I think that is a good thing to do, but there are many ways you can help this country. And I like to remind people that philanthropy is an ancient Greek word that means loving humanity. Doesn't mean rich people writing checks. You can love humanity with your time, your energy, your ideas, whatever you can do to help other people. Clearly that's what separates humans from the other species on the face of the earth. We try to help people and have the capacity and interest in helping people who are not necessarily related to us, but help other people maybe halfway around the world. And so all of you think about this. If you don't really wanna do something to help the country or help humanity, let me give you an incentive. I have a view that those people who help the country live a longer life. Now, the reason I say that is because when I talk to people who've done other things to help this country, they feel good about themselves. Nobody ever says, I just helped the country in some ways, I feel bad about myself. I'm upset, I just fed some people on a food line, I just worked at a soup kitchen, I feel bad for doing that. I just gave some scholarships to people, I hate myself for doing that. Nobody says that because they're happy that they've done something that made the country a slightly better place. And I think happy people live longer. People, my namesake, David Rockefeller Sr., lived to be 102. <laughs> and I'm also convinced that people that help the country not only live longer, but there's a special place in heaven reserved for them. Now, you might laugh about that, but why would you want to take a chance that I'm wrong? So. <laughs> Now, I got inspired to help the country in part because of the, uh, and I, I was trying to atone for my sins. As a young man, I worked in the White House. I got inflation to 19% under Jimmy Carter, and you know nobody's invited me back into government since then. So I've been trying to atone for my sins, but I actually trace it back not to having gotten inflation to 19% and interest rates to 17%, which is, nobody's done since. Um, I really trace it back to when I was in the sixth grade, John F. Kennedy gave a speech January the 20th, 1961. Some of you may remember this. It was a speech where he modeled it very much after Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill was somebody that John Kennedy greatly admired. Now, when Pre Kennedy was president, he invited Churchill to come to, the, to uh, the White House, and Churchill couldn't come at the time. But John Kennedy, as a young man, had met Churchill. He'd read his major speeches. He had read his major writings, and he really loved what, what, what Churchill did. Churchill, in every speech, would have what would be called a signature line, the, the line that is the one that people are gonna remember. And uh, Kennedy wanted to have that in his inaugural address. And he worked with uh, Ted Sorensen, his great speechwriter, and they had a line, and all of you may remember it. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And my sixth grade teacher went over that with me line for line, word for word, the entire speech. The whole speech was poetry in prose form, but that signature line stood out. And I always said to myself, what can I do to give back to my country? 
And I, I just resonated with you all the time that we should try to give back to this country which made our lives so wonderful and made us it possible to do so many things that we probably couldn't have done if we were in many other countries. And it, at that speech, when it ended, John Kennedy um, actually ended it with something that I, I think is also important for you all here to think about. He said, with a good conscience, our only sure reward, with history, the final judge of our deeds, let us go forth to lead the land we love, asking his blessing and his help, but knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. So I just ask all of you to think about this, what you might be able to do to make this world a better place and make this country a better place and do God's work on earth. Don't think, don't ignore what happened to, or don't forget what happened to somebody named Alfred Nobel. Alfred Nobel was sitting at his breakfast table in Stockholm one day and he read his obituary. It said, Alfred Nobel just died. Now he's reading it. And it said, thank God he's gone, the merchant of death, the inventor of dynamite, he's gone. Well, Alfred Nobel realized that it was his brother who had died, but the newspaper people got it wrong. But he had the advantage of then watching and reading his own obituary. Now, if any of you were to be able to read your own obituary, would you be happy with it? Would you all say, I'm happy with my life? Okay, I've done everything I can do, okay. But suppose you had a chance to say, well, I got maybe some things I wouldn't want in the obituary, or some things I would want it. So think about what you can do to give back to this country. It doesn't have to be one of the things I've chosen to remind people about history. I listed about 10 different problems this country has, internal challenges from homelessness to obesity, um, to dropout rates, to gun violence. What can you do, ask yourself, in one little way, one form or another, to make this world a better place, this country a better place, and to tackle some of these problems? The one I've just chosen is history, but there can be many others uh, that you can pick. And let me conclude with a letter that I also received today from somebody else, Harry Truman. <laughs> Dear Mr. Rubenstein, I hope you will not forget me in your remarks at Fulton. I was the one who persuaded Churchill to come to Missouri and accompany him on the long trade ride from Washington. It was a profitable venture because Churchill was such an inexperienced poker player that we made a fair amount of money along the way. Please tell my friends at Westminster that as Daniel Webster once said about his alma mater, it is a small college, but there are those of us who love it. I really love Westminster College and wish I could have attended. And if they need any help in getting speakers in the future, tell them to let me know. I am sure I can find someone big enough to make up for the fact that you are the best they could get this year. <laughs> that will not be hard, I guarantee you. But give everyone hell while you have the lectern. They deserve it for picking you this year. Best regards, Harry Truman. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Um, you know, Andrew Roberts spoke at lunch today on Churchill and humor, and I actually think uh, we can now call that speech Churchill Rubenstein in the humor. Um, Edwina Sands today, in front of her breakthrough sculpture, said that words matter, and Churchill embodied that and how he spoke and how he lived, and certainly, you know, your address tonight, words matter, history matter, and we so appreciate uh, you joining us and sharing with us. So thank you again. By the way, I think this is most brilliant that David did tonight. I've heard so many speeches, but I think tonight, brilliant, and I think that if my grandfather had been here, it would have been very exciting for him, and they could have had a very good conversation. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
I'd also like now to introduce John Paul Montepe, who was my predecessor of, as senior fellow of the Association of Churchill Fellows and is the vice chairman of the International Churchill Society. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Association of uh, Churchill Fellows and uh, of the uh, International Churchill Society, I'm delighted to welcome you as the newest member of the Association of Churchill Fellows, you. if you would accept this medal. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. David, don't, don't go away yet, please. We also have one other item we'd like to present to you this evening with our extended thanks for your great remarks, for your visit to the museum. Um, and to ensure that you come back um, whenever you'd like, we'd like to present to you this eyewitness to history. This is an original ticket to the 1946 speech in this gymnasium. It, it admits one, and it doesn't expire, so we okay. hope to get you back. Thank you very much. Thank you. And finally, I'd like to thank each of you uh, for without your support, your attendance, your continued commitment to Churchill, to the great monument of St. Mary the Virgin, Alderman Mary, to Westminster College, and to history. We are grateful, uh, and we commemorate and celebrate 50 years, looking very much forward to the next 50, to introduce new generations to the legacy and leadership of Winston Churchill, so that those who come here for the 100th anniversary will look back, perhaps as Jim Bennett said, toast the trustees of the class of 2019. <laughs> With that, I will get, bid you good night. I thank all of our speakers, uh, distinguished members of the Churchill family, fellows, trustees, faculty, alumni, students and staff of Westminster College. Please join us tomorrow at 10 o'clock a.m. for a very special service in the historic church of St. Mary the Virgin Alderman Mary. Uh, where, we induct, where we will induct uh, the rest of the fellows into the tw class of 2019. So we hope to see you this, not only this evening, but also tomorrow morning at church. Thank you very much again, and good night. <laughs>